Hey everybody, how you doing? So I'm on my lunch break and uh, I have seen a lot of craziness kind of get asked and, and and a lot of folks saying, hey, what the heck is going on? Um, there's a lot of resources out there, but I've had a few friends say, hey, do you know anything that's going on with the stock market? What's going on with the hedge funds? And I said, hey, I got about 45 minutes or so where I could sit down and kind of talk about this a little bit, uh, talk about some other stuff too. So I thought it would be prudent to go ahead and jump in and say hello. Um, as always, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to ask. I'm more than happy to uh, give you any information that I have and I uh, would be more than happy to uh, tell you about anything that is currently going on. Uh, I am just going to do one thing real quick, make sure everything is going on here. Boom, boom, boom. And that should work. Yep. Perfect. All right. So now that I have all that worked out, make sure that everything is working fine on my end. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what's going on. Um, so as people are starting to get in here, let's just kind of give the broad overview of what is actually happening with these hedge funds right now. Um, and uh, just to kind of let you know what, what the situation is. Uh, first off, the situation as it stands right now is there is some pretty wacky stuff going on specifically about GameStop, AMC, and a couple of other key institution stocks uh, that are being traded pretty rapidly right now. Um, and it's something that has to do with what is known as shorting a company. And a lot of people have asked, well, what do I think about this? What do I think is going on? Uh, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? And quite frankly, um, I'm kind of the mindset that we're looking at the good side of populism. Um, for those of you who have not been here before, for those of you who are watching this on repeat, um, you may not have seen some of my previous videos. I've talked at length about how being populist sometimes is actually a very bad thing because populism tends to be the um, kind of fiery moment uh, that people are kind of boiling over. It doesn't necessarily lead to good long-term strategies for economic growth or, or, or just good rules in general. It's usually the knee-jerk reaction stuff. Problem is, is that of course people want their 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 passions stoked and 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 quenched in a timely fashion. So if you tell people, hey, we can fix these problems, but it's going to take 15 years for it to happen, eh, that's not necessarily a great solution for folks. But if you tell them, hey, in the next 15 days we can we can burn it all to the ground, people tend to react to that. Um, by the way, thank you for following uh, Evian Drip. Uh, but the downside to that whole experiment is if you do uh, uh, lean into populism, you get a lot of people who tend to push to become more and more extreme. I talked about this and how during the election cycle, uh, the former president was very much a populist president and that caused a lot of problems because it kept feeding the worst impulses of people, um, especially in the conservative party. But there are other sides of populism that we could talk about as well. Um, and the result of that is when institutions have built themselves up for so long, they build these safeguards that don't allow people in. Um, and it basically means that they've insulated themselves from things happening. For instance, oh, sorry, I hit my microphone. Uh, for instance, if you remember back in 2008, 2009, we had the economic crash and the government came in to basically flood money into those institutions, stock markets, different trading uh, places in order to make sure that those companies would not fold because the ramifications on the stock market would be absolutely uh, horrific. And in that situation, it made sense. And to be fair, they actually did pay back all of that money within a fairly short amount of time. I think most of it was paid back within three or four years. Um, so economically, it made sense. Problem is, and, and this is something that I think a lot of people don't recall, is a lot of the stuff had to do with basically Wall Street and different types of funds kind of playing loosey goosey, well, not kind of, absolutely playing loosey goosey with the rules. And those rules then hurt people. It hurt their investments. It hurt their long-term savings and people lost their shirts. And ever since then, we've seen that the stock market, while being a place that should be stable, can be subject to just as much fluctuation as we've seen in other institutions, such as the housing booms and things like that, or the technology booms. So what does that mean today? What does that translate into today? In the last 11 to 12 years, the ability for us to use our phones, apps, 
um, have become incredibly powerful because people want you to stay on your phone as much as possible and do as many things through easy applications as much as humanly possible. So we have an application for everything. You can order your food. Hell, you can order gas in advance. You can trade stocks. With that combined with social media, people have been able to create these little bubbles where they can talk about what they want to do with their money and talk to like-minded people so they can make smart investments. This all came to a head when some really smart guys were noticing that hedge funds were doing a short on certain stocks. Now, let me explain what a short is. Now, I am not an economics expert when it comes to stock trading, but I did read up a lot on this. I do keep track of this stuff just because I like to be in the know of these things. Um, so I'm going to give you my lay response. I can give you some bad information here by accident. It is not my intention. Always make sure to double check and look at other sources to go ahead and corroborate what I'm saying. But the simple idea is normally a stock for a company is something that you buy in earnest, in good faith, where you're investing your money so that that company can succeed. It gives them revenue so they can invest it and they can continue to grow or sustain their growth. The idea is that that invested revenue can then hopefully generate more income because they're able to make more profits. And then you're able to get what are known as dividends back. So if you make over a certain amount on your dividends, you actually get a check cut to you. Or if you want, you can actually sell that stock at a higher point. So if you invested $5 and then it uh, goes up to a $20 stock and you sell it, you net $15 of profit. Pretty straightforward. And that's how the stock market normally works. Enter hedge funds. Now, hedge funds are very complicated. They use precise mathematical algorithms. They use incredibly smart people. And they also use a wide variety of tools in order to look at stock markets, look at trends, and to find places where there could be weakness or strength that they can basically bet upon. And what this allows them to do is they basically borrow uh, stocks. So they go to a stock firm and they say, I would like to borrow... 2000 stock of GameStop. Now, normally what this means is that this borrowing for the time being is just going to be a net amount of money. So if you say, hey, I want to go ahead and borrow this, they'll sell it to you at $10 a share or, or, or something along those lines. Um, then if the stock goes down because you have bet that it will go down, when it actually is purchased, you net $3 profit from each piece of stock. What that means is you basically are betting against the company to fail. You, you, you say, hey, this is where I'm willing to pay. And you're hoping that it goes lower. And then basically when you're forced to buy that stock at a lower value that, or, or, or when you're able to buy or when, when that stock finally transfers hands to you, that discrepancy between what was promised and what is actually paid gives you a payout. So if it's promised at 10, you only have to pay seven, boom, you've made $3 profit. So that is a pretty good way of, a, of understanding how the shorting is going to work. But here's the thing. These are promised stocks. So when you're thinking of a promised stock, that means that it's not necessarily available to you, but it will be available to you in the future. So what these everyday folks like you and I did is they got together and they started buying out all the game stock, uh, GameStop stock that they could. They went and they found every piece that they could. They just bought, 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 and bought. So that did two things. The first thing is it started to push up the value of that stock. So over the last year, that stock, which was trading for, you know, like $15, $20 a share, has slowly started to rise. And in the last couple of weeks, because these shorts are starting to come due, has skyrocketed because more and more people are buying into it. So they were hoping that it was going to be at like, you know, $10 a share, right? And they were hoping it was going to go lower and they were going to make some money off of it. But the problem is that they're still obligated to get that stock. But now it's going the opposite direction. So it's going up instead of down. So they've said, I will buy this. And they were expecting no more than $10. But they have obligated themselves. Now, you know, th this stock is shot through the roof. You know, you're looking at $130, $150, uh, $180. It it's, it's wildly varying. And what that means is now these people are in, you know, uh, just per, you know, stock, you know, they're down, you know, $120. $130 per stock. And they have bought 10,000, 100,000, you know, 200,000 of the stock promises. But the stock doesn't exist. It's not there because other people have already purchased it. So that's the second thing that's happened. Not only have people bought it and they have pushed up the value, 
those stocks aren't there, which means that right now they're basically in breach of contract. And these hedge funds now have to basically pay out the revenue that was supposed to be paid out, but they can't. So they're in this place where basically they've gambled money. They've gambled that they would be able to get this particular stock, but people are holding on to it. And because they're holding on to it, it's pushing the value up even more. I'm okay with this. And this is, I think most people who are like myself and, and like most Americans who work every single day, they go to their jobs, they, they, they have to pay for their bills. They don't have trust funds. They don't have nest eggs. I think most people are okay with this because what this is, is a very expensive version of gambling. And what makes it worse is that most hedge funds are gambling with other people's money. I don't like that. If you have a million dollars and you want to invest your own million dollars and you're okay with losing it, if it goes south, that's fine. That's one thing. But if you're a person who is going to sit around and borrow other people's money or people are investing in your hedge fund and then you're risking their monies on these kind of bets, which are never guaranteed, I'm not a fan of that. Not only that, I am a huge, huge, huge fan of the fact that we were told that the stock market is a place where everybody can come, be treated equally, and they can have a fair shake. But the fact of the matter is, is that in general, you're not able to take these kind of guesses because you don't have the collecting buying power that a giant hedge fund does or a giant investment corp does. And that means that even though you might have the sheer desire and passion to try to improve your station in life by buying stocks, it becomes a, a kind of a hard road where you have to make you know educated guesses, but you can't really bump up past a certain rate. Well, this is now the flip side of that because all these people can sit together and they could say, hey, let's all buy together. They become their own it's not a hedge fund, but it's basically their own little mini conglomerate that's saying, we're going to now buy this all up. And we're investing not only in each other, but also against these people who are betting against companies. And that's something I want to be very clear on here. People are betting for companies to fail. Now, I don't like that as far as stock markets are concerned. I believe if you're buying a stock, you should earnestly want that stock to succeed. If you're buying GameStop, you should want GameStop to succeed. Sorry, I keep hitting my microphone. I'm going to push it back a little bit. Um, you should want to see that stock succeed. You should not want to see it fail. And the downside or, 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 or the part of me that really hates this is the fact that basically what's happening right now is the people are seeing that, you know, the, these hedge funds are betting against companies and they're hoping that they're going to fail so they can net money. And I'm like, screw that. You know, that just that, that's like me going to my friend and saying, hey, I really hope you succeed and then put all my money on them. Like, let's say they're boxing or something to, to lose the big fight or they're going to play in a basketball game and I'm betting against them. It just feels very unethical. It feels very, very slimy. And, and, and quite frankly, I'm not a fan of it. And I know that's how a lot of hedge funds are able to generate revenue quickly. Um, the other side of this that. I know for me, it is really kind of sticking with me right now, is the fact that hedge funds and other types of investment firms, they have the ability to insulate their, their uber rich investors by creating this massive wall. And what I mean by a massive wall is this. They say, hey, we're going to invest 300,000 shares into GameStop, and then we're going to try to force them to buy it back. So this is what happens. They're betting against GameStop. Then after they've bet against GameStop, they start writing letters to the company saying, you should use all of your discretionary money to buy the stock back from us. Because if you don't, it's going to be bad. And they're trying to pressure that company to basically cut its own throat in order to try to preserve its own stock value. That is a slime ball thing to do. So what these everyday folks like you and I did is they got together and they said, no, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to buy these stocks. We're going to hold on to them and we're going to make it impossible for you to complete your transactions. So now all of this muscle that the, the hedge funds were hoping to put onto the company is now on themselves. And that is absolutely, I believe, karmic justice. I believe that hedge funds play way too willy-nilly with our money and also with the money of others. I also believe that if you're looking at this in whole, you also have to keep in mind that the uber rich, they might lose their shirt on this deal, but they're going to be fine. They got whole closets worth of shirts, right? So they might lose a shirt or two, but they're, they're going to be fine. These hedge funds, though, are going to go out of business.
And I think that's smart um, because I don't like the idea of betting against people. And I really don't like the idea that when people figure out your game, you then say, oh, I need a bailout. Or, oh, I need you to stop trading for this. In fact, actually, I looked it up. Hold on. Let me see here. Um, so the flip side of this is that now trading applications such as Robinhood started to say, hey, we're not going to allow you to uh, uh, continue to buy up any of these stocks because you're actually screwing up all the algorithms because you're not part of this, this system. You're actually trying to break the system. So here are some of the stocks that you can no longer buy on Robinhood, which, by the way, its entire application is meant to be for the people, by the people. So it's meant to be something for the little guy to be able to get a little bit of money so they can actually create some wealth. And now that they're finally doing it, they're like, whoa, 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 not like that. It's very scumbaggy. But here are some of the stocks that Robinhood has said, nope, you can't buy anymore. You can only finish your transaction. American Airlines, AMC, BlackBerry, Best Buy, Castor Maritime, Express, GameStop, Koss, Naked, Nokia, Sundial, Tootsie Roll and Trivago. All of those are basically in a lockdown when it comes to Robinhood. And it basically is this idea of, hey, we're trying to protect you because we don't want to see volatility in the market. I say, screw that. Now, this is where we're going to go a little political because unfortunately you can't talk about this without also talking about the politics involved with money. But if you go back in time to the turn of the 20th century, basically the late 1800s going into the early 19th century, there is something known as the progressive slash new era. It starts around 1870, I believe, and it goes to about 1925, ballpark. So it's about 45 years or so. During this time, massive reformations happened in America. At that point, the economic imbalance was the worst it has ever been. We are getting close to that economic imbalance now. But during that time, people were being exploited. Corporations were going crazy. Basically, there was a massive amount of power in the corporations and in the uber rich and the median class, the middle class, the working class. They were all basically being crushed under all these different types of obligations. In fact, let me give you a really good example. There used to be things known as corporate towns. If you've never heard of this concept, it's really crazy. But the idea here, oh, <laughs> hold on, one of my buddies popped up here for a second. He said, I like your little pop graphic noise. Thank you, Al. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but so corporate towns actually work on a very, very screwed up. Just I, I hate this. And when I tell it to you, it's going to make your eye twitch. Corporate towns were towns that were established by companies to be near their production farms. Maybe they were making uh, steel, maybe they were coal towns, whatever, but they were towns that were built by the companies. And inside those companies, they're like, hey, here you go. You live here. You got all the stuff you need. We got our own supermarket, all this stuff. We've built a town, rock it out. But they wouldn't pay you in American dollars. They would pay you in corporate funds. So when you got paid, you would then go down and you would use that corporate money to go into the corporate stores and then to go and get like the corporate clothes and so on and so forth. You couldn't just take that money and then invest it somewhere else. You couldn't just take that money and then leave. You were basically obligated because of the way they were paying you to spend it in their town. So you're working and living in their town. And then you're, any money that they're paying you is going right back into their pockets because they're forcing it to you. You're not allowed to have the free market ability to roam around and to spend where you want to spend. Does that sound a little bit familiar right now? Does this sound a little Robin Hood in me, right? Like, you know, oh, yeah, you could totally spend what you want to spend where you want to spend it so long as you spend it where we tell you to. You know, you can't just go and buy what you want. And that's the thing that I hate about this idea of unchecked capitalism. I believe in a capitalistic market, but I also believe in a socialistic market. I believe most places that have gotten it right are capitalist socialist societies. They realize that capitalism is good. It stimulates growth, it stimulates innovation, and it stimulates the ability to move forward and to have people uh, pull themselves out of their current situations. But I also believe that there are social contracts that we have that we build with that. We make sure that people have proper education. We make sure they have proper uh, 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 health care. We make sure that nobody goes hungry when we can afford to feed people. Things like that, right? So yes, you can do what you want to with your business, but you know, you also have these safeguards. And I think that that's a pretty good balance between the two. But when you look at a capitalist society that starts to basically tell people it's only good for us, but not for you, 
that's no longer capitalism. It's not the free market. It's the it's free for us market, but you have a different set of rules. That's greed. And that's what we ran across in the progressive era. The progressive era was like, nope, we're not doing this anymore. Radical civil rights change. Women were starting to be given power. People were able to start to really conglomerate their ability to put the power in the hands of the people. The working class, the middle class, the upper middle class, they all started to build, uh, 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 well, basically unions. They started building unions. They started to build power bases that were outside of the control of the uber elite, of the corporations. And it was so bad bad that eventually the Senate and the House had to come in. They had to bust up those corporations. It was called corporate busting. Um, basically, that's why we don't have monopolies. That's why we don't see this stuff up. Now, populism does not have the best track record in the world when it comes to making the most smart moves. Uh, in fact, Evan uh, Evian Tripp here makes a really good point, which is they kind of effed up on the alcohol thing. That's right. The populist movement who gave power to the people also said, you know what? I don't think people should have alcohol. Okay, so they missed the boat on that one. And I think that that's a fair criticism. I think that populism alone is just as bad as raw, naked greed. We have to have these counterbalances, these checks. And I think it has to do with the idea of can people still do well? Can people still make money, but also still have the ability to control their own destiny and, and make sure they're all paying into the same social contract? And I think that in the last 40 years or so, we've gotten really far away from that. Um, and one of the reasons why I think this is because populism is very much on the rise right now. Populism for the last 20, 25 years has slowly started to creep back up into politics. Um, and it's, again, not necessarily a bad thing because what it does is it shocks the, the, the proletariat, uh, whatever you want to call them, the, 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 the elites, uh, uh, your political leaders, whatever you would like to refer to them as. But it, the people who are in charge, they realize, oh, crap, if we don't make sure that things are being distributed equitably and people all have that fair chance at the American dream or, or a fair society, they're going to turn on us. That's what happened in the progressive era. And it was 40 years of radical change. And the entire time, they kept trying to fight it. So by the time you get to the 20s, basically, the rich elite said, no, we're going to keep doing it this our way. And what happens is you get to the great stock market crash, which led to the Great Depression. And it took World War II for us to get out of that. Now, we've learned a lot since then. We know what the tricks are. We know what the problems are. And the fact that Ted Cruz and AOC are both saying, Robin Hood, you're doing a bad job. People who are saying that the free market is good and now you're saying they can't trade on the free market, mm -mm, we're not going to allow that. So you can see that our lawmakers are already throwing up flags saying, mm -mm, no, 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 no. If this is a true free market, then we have to sit down and say, you have to let this play out. And if it's not a true and free market, why isn't it? This is all a roundabout way for me to come back to the, the, the point, which is, I believe that what we're going through right now is a populist movement to give power back to the middle class. I believe that things that we've been seeing lately are all these examples. I think people want to have the ability to know that their kids are going to have the ability to see a doctor. I think they want to know that they're going to be able to be paid a livable wage that's not going to break their back every single day. I think they want to know that education is going to be taken care of because A, we make it mandatory, and B, you can't do anything without a good education, right? I mean, you have to at least have the right technical skills to go and become a plumber or an electrician. That still is an education. You have to go off to a technical college. Those kind of things, you know, need to kind of be covered. Like we need to cover these things. And the fact is, is that when you look at stuff like what the minimum wage is right now, people are starving. They don't have the ability to control their own destiny and they hate it. And so they say, well, hey, let's kick that minimum wage up. Let's make it $15 an hour or whatever, right? And all of a sudden people say, oh, oh, oh what about inflation? Things are going to raise in uh, prices. And I look at stuff and I say, the basic federal minimum wage hasn't changed for years and things are still going up in price. So this inflation that you're worried about is already happening. Adjust the payment appropriately. Give people a chance to do what they need to do. If they want to invest money in a certain place, let them invest that money. If that is not a good investment of time, or if that is not a good investment of resources, explain to us why. And I think really what it comes down to is the fact that we're now seeing that, and this is the, the amazing part of the, the time that we're living in, social media, the ability for people 
to talk to each other can be very dangerous. We saw that on January 6th, right? When people who are extremely radicalized get together, it can be a scary thing. But people who want to see uh, the economy actually benefit everybody and not just the uber rich, that's an interesting thing that's happening. And what it's going to do is it's going to start to make people on in Congress actually say, maybe we need to listen to this. Oh, I got a comment here real quick. Let's see here. Uh, we have big capital hate it when people organize. Their power only exists in a world where the proletariat are starved of power. And that is a pretty good way to look at it, too. Um, it's true. In, in a democracy, and especially in a, a representational government like we have a republic, um, yes, there is a certain amount of control that we give up to people who are more educated or perhaps more focused on working on just those issues. But at the same time, we trust them to make sure that everybody gets a fair shake. And we've seen what happens in the past when that doesn't happen. Um, in fact, if you go back to the progressive era, which, by the way, just Google and read the wiki and then start reading books on it. The progressive era is a fascinating time in American politics, uh, in America in general, because we're coming in, uh, we're, we're leaving the Industrial Revolution, we're moving into uh, uh, the, the, the 20th century. There is a lot of crazy things that are happening. And the power structures that had been there, there were basically corporate power structures and the uber rich on top of them break apart. And we see the building blocks that would lead to more or less 30 to 40 years of unchecked growth and prosperity. My grandparents, some of yours, great grandparents were able to basically change their station permanently. But then as the seventies and the eighties rolled around, they started peeling all that back because they had made the money and they wanted to keep the money. And so they started kind of, for lack of a better term, dicking over people, uh, future generations and started to close those holes. Um, it wasn't a good look, you know, by the time you get to the 80s, greed is good, right? And by the 90s, it had been established and cemented. And we're now seeing the fallout from all that. This is a cycle that we have to break. Um, and until we do, we're going to go through these moments. But what I think we're seeing is I really, really think what we're seeing right now is we're actually seeing the improvement of our society through confrontation. And let me explain what I mean. Confrontation is not, I'm going to punch you in the face and I'm going to yell at you and I'm going to, you know, be a, a, a rude person to you. Confrontation in this particular instance is something more of, I'm not going to sit here and let a conversation pass. Uh, think of it like this. You're at Thanksgiving or, or, or a holiday dinner and you have that uncle, aunt, brother, sister, whomever that always has the opposing opinion with you. How many times have you just said, forget it, it's not worth it, and you've walked away from that conversation? And you've said, it's not worth it. That builds up residue. When you tell the other person that they're not worth it, it builds up animosity. Whether you realize it or not, you immediately start to block them out in total, and it starts to build. It, it, it's like plaque on your teeth, right? It just continues to build and build and build, eventually get yellow and nasty and gnarly, and nobody likes that as, a, as an end result. So confrontation, the ability for you to have a conversation with somebody, not negatively, I mean, it can become negative, but the ability to confront somebody with their ideals so that you can better understand them, so that you can better understand your own position, and then to move into a more common ground is absolutely critical. And I think that's what we're seeing right now, is I think we're seeing the building blocks and the basis of that. The problem is, is that in this particular instance, We've let echo chambers really take over where we don't want to hear each other. We, we've gone to the point where we're almost demonizing. And in some cases, people really do demonize the other side. If they don't agree with me 100%, they are evil. They are nonstop evil. And, and there's a difference between somebody who is, say, uh, uh, economically conservative. Uh, you know, they don't like to, you know, give, you know, handouts. They don't like to, you know, they don't like to do things like uh, uh, big social plans, stuff like that. They want to keep the money and let people invest their own money versus somebody who's more liberal who says, hey, let's build social plans. Yeah, our taxes are going to go up, but the benefits will greatly outweigh them. Those are not necessarily two conflicting ideals that that can't find common ground. They can. Other things like, you know, I'm just a flaming racist, punch racist in the face, right? I mean, if somebody's like, you know, a Nazi or something that, you know, we all go Indiana Jones on Nazis. That's just a common agreement. I think the entire planet's pretty much in agreement on that one. Um, but when it comes to stuff like this, there's a lot of common ground. And I'll give you a perfect example. 
uh, this past weekend, I was at a friend's house uh, and uh, my wife and I, we were hanging out with, with our friends um, and they are pretty conservative. And we had a wonderful time. We talked about all kinds of things. We talked about the election. We talked about uh, uh, economics. We talked about all kinds of things. And at no point did the conversation ever become you're evil, you're bad, you're terrible, even though we're fairly opposite diametrically. It was an interesting conversation. I heard their concerns. They heard my concerns. They heard my wife's concerns and so on and so forth. And we were able to find common ground and go, oh yeah, well, this is actually a really big plate of stuff that we can agree on. And it's like the fringy kind of stuff where we're like still trying to figure it out. That's the beauty of this is social media has given us the ability to start to build that plate again, where we can find all the good things that we can put in the middle. Um, and I think what we're seeing right now is most of America is tired of the stock market having the ability to trade the way they want to, to make billions of dollars, or if they fail and they lose billions of dollars, to just say, hey, I need a bailout. And then $2.8 billion is given you know, by various investment firms or whatnot. But if you or your dad or your mom or your cousin or somebody else says, hey, I'm in a tough bind, I need 10 grand in order to make it through the next six months because COVID, whatever, you know, the, the companies go, I don't know if I can do that. That's pretty shitty, you know, and it's a double standard. You know, I, I hate the fact that Congress is even remotely talking about the fact that, oh, well, you know, we might have to relook at these $1,400 checks that we're going to send out to Americans, you know, in order to make sure that they're going to be OK. Bitch, sign the checks, send them out. All right. If you, you have sent out so many different tax bonuses and tax uh, 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 breaks and, and, and written out more or less blank checks to so many corporations when they need it, the American people need you to do this and they need you to stop the stock markets from challenging the people from having the ability to buy the stocks they want to. Yeah, I think that covered it. I think I got there. Like I said, I had to go a little political there. So I apologize for anybody who doesn't like to hear too much politics stuff, but you can't, you got to talk about how we've built the system in order to understand it. But I personally think that we're starting to see the positive side of this. We're starting to see the positivity that's going to come out of this. And it's going to take a while to get there. Um, this is something that's not going to resolve in a year. This is not something that's going to resolve in three years. As far as all these little changes, this is stuff that we're all collectively going to have to say, we need to continue to move this forward. Um, but 10 years, we could see some very, very cool changes happen to our culture in total. And I think that really happens on a person to person level stuff like this right now you know we've had one person watching this all the way up to 15 people watching it you know the the, the view counts change but every person that we talk to every person that's hearing me and is at least giving me a chance to have this conversation um you know that's how we make changes we don't do it through violence we do it through places like you know, voting with our wallet at Wall Street. We do it through, you know, voting booths. We do it by investing our money where we want to support, you know, people and businesses. That's important. And that's a big reason why Laura and I have decided to pick up something new. Um, and this is a great place to announce it since we're talking about, you know, kind of things and 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 how America works and and, and how our politics works and with our daily lives, uh, civics basically. Um, I made a joke about three weeks ago that I must have been one of the few kids who actually paid attention in in social studies slash civics um, because you know they pick a really bad time to teach you like some of the most important things you need to know as an American. Um, it's basically like eighth through 10th grade, right? Um, your hormones are going nuts. Your brain is basically just flooded with, you know, you're, you're trying desperately to break out and become your own independent person. But here they are trying to teach you what the system is. And it's just not a good time. Plus, you know, I mean, hormones also lead to, you know, boys or girls or, or you're just, it's, you're figuring yourself out. You know, you're, you're, you're basically trying to understand who you are as a person. And I was like, we, we, a lot of people missed out on the ability to really learn some of this stuff. So Laura and I, starting next week, I think we're going to be doing this on Tuesdays. It'll be a live show. It'll be about 90 minutes to two hours long, and it's going to be called Constitution Check. And we're going to have three segments, and we hope you'll come and check it out with us. The first segment will be a topic of the week. I'll pick something, uh, possibly maybe the First Amendment. Maybe we'll talk about, you know, like the, today, the stocks. 
perfect example of something we could talk about on Constitution Check. Uh, then we're going to do a test. We're going to actually ask questions and we're going to give answers on things that every American should know. We'll, we'll tell you more about that next week. Uh, and then the last half hour will be some news and our thoughts on things that are happening that you may or may not want to keep an eye on. And the great part is, is since we're going to be doing it live, you'll be able to communicate with us, ask questions, uh, and even make suggestions for future topics. So that's something that'll be coming up next week. And I hope you'll come and check it out. This is kind of like a little mini pilot program of that. Um, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think it'll also allow people to not only ask questions about American politics, but to understand why we made certain reasons. Um, I've already talked to some folks, some very nice people who are lawyers and constitutional specialists or people who can get me in touch with those folks that are willing to kind of help us make sure we give you the best information uh, possible. Um, but the very first episode, uh, uh, we actually had a question here. Hold on. I'll pull it up real quick. Uh, the very first episode, uh, idea is actually going to be about something that most people do not understand in America. We're going to be talking about the first amendment and we're going to talk about how freedom of speech isn't what you think it is. Um, and we're going to kind of lay it all out for you. So since people always say, oh, they're violating my freedom of speech, we're going to talk about why they're not. And why you absolutely need to understand what your, 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 uh, uh, my brain just completely blanked on the word, ah, rights. How did I forget the word rights? Uh, but what your rights are uh, when it comes to freedom of speech. So absolutely going to be that. And then we're going to talk about some stuff uh, and we're going to reveal what the test is going to be, but it's going to be a test. Uh, I can't wait to talk to you about that. Laura came up with it. It's a fantastic idea, but I want to keep it on the DL until the first episode. But I promise you it's going to be great. Um, and then, of course, we'll do some news of the week stuff. Uh, and that'll be something we'll do every week. Uh, 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 maybe we'll, if it gets really popular, we'll do it more. But I, I think once a week is good. Um, and if we decide to skip a week, we'll let you guys know at the end of the episode if we're going to skip a week or something. So that way you won't tune in the following week. Go, where are you guys at? Um, but yeah, there you go. So I hope that you were able to learn some stuff here. Uh, and I hope that if you're just joining us, that you'll come back next week. I do believe it'll be next uh, Tuesday afternoon, uh, Eastern Standard Time, probably in the evening, I'd say 7 or so, uh, uh, 7 p.m. or so uh, on Tuesday evening, um, Eastern Standard, we're going to be doing our first episode of Constitution Check, and it's going to be pretty freaking cool. I do hope that you'll come and join us with that. Uh, but with that, uh, I got a couple minutes here. My lunch break is usually about 45 minutes or so. So I got about I got about six minutes. Um, were there any questions that anybody had before we wrap up so we can go ahead and um, uh, get out of here? Um, and uh, yeah, take care of that. Um, ooh. One question I do get asked while you guys go ahead and type in um, a lot is, are you going to be doing any more art projects? Yes, we will be doing some uh, Perler Bead stuff on Saturday. So if you want to see art stuff and not hear about the politics and whatnot anymore, definitely come back on Saturday. I promise we'll try to keep it as political free as possible. Um, but yeah, if you guys knew the amount of influx I've been getting since we started doing these updates, um, whew, it, it, it's a little nuts. Um, clearly, you guys have a hunger for learning more about this, understanding more about American politics, understanding what we're doing, how we put things together, and just how kind of like, you know, our constitution, our society works. I'm like, hey, let's let's let, let's talk about that. Uh, but we are a mom and pop place. We are pop cycle bobbles. You guys can see, oops, there we go. You can see that right over there. We are pop cycle bobbles. My wife and I make things by hand. We actually make uh, really great comic inspired artwork. We make eight bit statues, bags, accessories, all kinds of cool stuff, and we sell it normally um, at conventions. But since everything's been shut down for COVID, not a lot to do about that. We've been building up stockpiles, um, but we do have some shows coming up later in the year and uh, we're finally getting back to it. So we will be doing some more art stuff as well. And during those shows, we'll talk about geeky stuff. We'll talk about WandaVision and Star Trek and we'll, we'll geek out on geeky things and we'll, we'll try to keep the political stuff during the constitution check on Tuesdays. Um, and like I said, if you guys haven't followed me, make sure to check me out over there on, oh, see, I, I always get backwards here, um, on my social media. You can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, uh, and I'll make sure to send out a tweet letting you guys know probably about an hour before we go live on Tuesday when to expect us. Um, if I make a graphic prior to that, I'll make sure to do it a couple days so that way you can tell your friends. But uh, if you like this, feel free to tell your friends. Make sure to tell everybody to come and check us out. Hit that um, 
follow button. Uh, if you're on YouTube, hit subscribe. Uh, uh, just come and check us out. Uh, thank you all so much for hanging out with us. I hope you like this kind of pilot program that we did for Constitution Check. I hope uh, we were able to elaborate uh, basically what's going on with GameStop and uh, why it's just I really dislike it uh, as far as what they're doing right now, stopping people from being able to buy more stocks. I whew, let the free market be the free market. And if not, then maybe you should admit that it's just basically a game for rich people and that we should probably change it. Um, but other than that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. As always, until this pandemic passes, we're going to end the same way we always do. Thank you so much. If you're working in the medical field, you are all amazing. If you are a vital uh, 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 first responder, somebody who has to teach a class uh, in a classroom, you're working in uh, nurses, uh, you, you having to deliver food, anything like that, you are all amazing. You are all heroes. You are fantastic humans, and we appreciate you every single day. Everybody else, make sure to help protect these people and protect yourselves by keeping socially distanced. Wash your hands for at least 20 seconds at a time. Use hand sanitizer. Wear those masks. Take care of yourself and take care of each other. And we'll see you on the next one. Take care.